This is an unusual experience for me because I haven't prepared this talk really as such. I want to rely to a large extent on what I remember, which is uh, hopefully very accurate. That, uh, normally when I have to give a talk to society, I would have researched it and looked for every little uh, bit of information I could get and put it in order and, and so forth. I've mulled over this several times and apart from looking at the minute books, I uh, really rely to a large extent on what I remember. <coughs> so I'll start off by talking about one of my favourite topics, which is me. Uh, <coughs> stand up, Frank. See you better. Stand up? See you better if you stand up. Oh. It's, it's on pressure down to Barbara. Well, I've always been interested in local history. It seems to me that I caught some sort of a virus as a child. And uh, it has uh, never left me. Because in my early teens I was uh, fascinated by local things and when I came back home to the local school here I was constantly in conversation sorry Robert am I in the light? No, 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 somebody take a glass of water. Do you want a glass of water? Huh? Water! Do you want a glass of water? No, I'm okay. Are you okay? Uh, well I might not before all was done but I intend to be out of here by 11. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, I was always interested. When I came to teach here in, in, at home, I was constantly in conversation with Griff Wiley, Mickey Waddle, and others about the possibility and how nice it would be to start a local history society. We talked about it and talked about it. Griff, we talked to John uh, uh, McSherry four times, Lewis Smart, and various other associates of his. And uh, all were interested in local history society, but didn't do anything about it. Then in 1968, and I think that was an important date, uh, Ahan Park was the new houses were built, and Michael Anderson came to live in one of those houses. And Michael joined this discussion group. <clears throat> it was very informal, and uh, we talked about it. We talked about it, and after about three years we decided okay we'll have a meeting and so the first meeting of the organization took place in 1971 and the minutes here are, were written by <coughs> young fellow Michael Hudson was the first minute secretary and uh, he says that the, in, the inaugural meeting of Point Post uh, and District Local History Society took place on Monday the 31st of May 1971 in the Billiard Hall at Church Street Points Pass. Those present were Griff Wiley, Mick Waddle, Patrick McSherry Sr., Joe Devlin, Pat McSherry, Michael Anderson, Frank Waters and Michael Hudson. It was decided unanimously that a local history society should be formed and the name Points Pass and District Local History Society was de decided upon. Now, <clears throat> I can remember there was a considerable discussion about the name of the, the organisation and uh, it was decided to call it a local history society simply because we thought we wanted it to be local, we didn't want it to be an historical society as such, we wanted it to focus on local things and uh, that's something I yap on about from time to time at our committee meetings to this same very day. <coughs> a discussion then took place on a wide range of topics which would interest the society. To get the society off the ground it was decided to invite a guest speaker. Griff Wiley undertook to contact either Major Reside of Newry or the Reverend Dewar, former rector of Scarborough, both active local historians. The meeting adjourned and the next meeting was left open until uh, a special uh, table. The next meeting a committee was established and aims were uh, outlined. The aims of the society really were to record, to research local history, to record events in the village and area 
of, that would be of interest to historians in the future, to acquire a local building, restore it, and make it a centre for our activities. And as you heard Roy saying earlier, that's something that has still not been achieved. <coughs> but it's only 50 years after all. Mm -hmm. uh, the membership fee was a pound for adults and 25p, five shillings for uh, juveniles. Interesting that the, 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 the juvenile fee is put in both a decimal currency and sterling or imperial currency. The five shillings is down as well because that was the era when we were still getting used to uh, this new money. And uh, so the new first committee was Chairman Griffith Wiley, Vice Chairman Michael Anderson, Treasurer McModdle and Secretary Frank Waters and all there at those present. Uh, Lewis Smart, Janet Smart, John McSherry, Mrs. Annie McSherry, Benedict Roberty, Michael Hudson, Terence Murray and John Waddell were all members of the committee. Uh, and Griff reported that he had been in touch with Major Reside and he was going to come. <coughs> and uh, he had a great collection of maps which he and Judy did come and show in the old school. Well, immediately certain problems arose. One was uh, how do you do local history? We didn't know what we, we, we had started the society, but what we were going to do about it. Uh, we felt the need to meet regularly and to keep our members active. During the summer months, that wasn't really a big problem. We could arrange outings of our own, but, but speakers were a problem. I was the secretary, and uh, it's, well, it's worth bearing in mind that 50 years ago, communications were very, very poor by today's standard. The, and where I lived, there were uh, many houses, well, 46 houses. I don't think there was a single phone in those 46 houses. There was a phone box in the village square. Uh, uh, my communications with the potential speakers were nearly all via letter because many of the potential speakers didn't have phones either. So that took time. It was quite a burden as a secretary to do that. Eventually I got in touch with a, a person that I'd met at Queen's University, a man called Grenville Morton, and I outlined our problems to Grenville Morton. He was head of the extramural department at Queen's, and the extramural department is a kind of an outreach uh, arm of the university to go out into the community. So Grenville Morton undertook to organise a, a series of talks, a season of talks, as he would call it, running from September uh, 20, uh, 2019, 72, I think it was, through the April of the following year. That took a tremendous weight of, uh, uh, of the shoulders of the secretary, I might say. <clears throat> In, in passing, I would say everything about technology. And I, I, I'm not being beamed to the four corners of the world. Uh, which, by the way, excuse my appearance, a crown came off one of my teeth. <laughs> so if I have an odd blow down, you know what happened. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I'd prefer to wear my mask, but they wouldn't let me. But anyway. <laughs> <coughs> uh, technology has gone beyond the beyond. I mean, uh, somewhere in the minutes it said that I had borrowed an overhead projector from school. Remember overhead projectors? And uh, uh, borrowed is probably a euphemism. But anyway, uh, the, the, we, we, one of the first things the society did was to buy a tape recorder. It was a tape recorder, one of those reel-to-reels tape recorders. We actually saw the tape, completely anti 
how to quit it now, and never was a success. I do remember the first time we got it, it cost £38, and uh, it was a big, big expense, because the, the, the treasurer reported at the next meeting that there was £6.23 and 23 pence in the kitty. <laughs> Uh, but the first words spoken on that tape recorder, see does it work, were spoken by Lewis Smart. <coughs> I remember that Lewis said, and that what he said was, you know the way I say, say something, somebody say something. <laughs> Lewis said, Mary had a little laugh. <laughs> she passed her plate for more. That was, that was what Lewis said. Anyway, to get back to the story, we got into a routine then of uh, uh, this at the state to the staff talks from September through to April and outings from May to July and August. Now, my own involvement in the society had been total nearly for the first year and a half, but then I did the unpardonable thing, I left my way. And uh, when I come home, my circumstances have changed, and I wasn't involved in the society for the next eight or nine years. And I was still interested in local history and still doing some research and still talking to the members, the Grip and Becky Wadden and Becky Anderson, etc. And so I knew about the doings of it. But uh, <clears throat> During those years, and it's important to remember as well that those were extremely bad years in our country. There was an awful lot of trouble all around us, but somehow or another, uh, this society managed to keep going. I should have said that one of the things we decided at the very first meeting was that this society was going to have to be cross-community. We didn't want a society that was one-sided or the other, and we all agreed that if it was going to be like that, we wouldn't be part of it. So from the beginning, we wanted it to be cross-community, and thankfully, it has remained so. And I think that during the, the worst times of the trouble, the Local History Society has been a, a sort of a, what would the word be, a sort of a, a stand out for the community to rally round. <coughs> anyway, for the next 10 years approximately, Granville Morton did his business. He produced figures from September right through. And uh, uh, Michael Anderson, Bridge Hearn, Barbara's mum, Mrs. Best, and various other stalwarts kept the society going. And uh, but around 1982 or 3, Grenville Morton suggested that the society should try to get its own speakers. I think he had become exhausted getting speakers for the society. And mind you, some of the speakers who came here were really, really eminent people. Uh, <clears throat> as you have noted already, this is disjointed. Anyway, Another problem that we, we faced in the early days was finding what we would call a neutral venue, somewhere where everybody could meet comfortably and happily. We attempted to locate several houses around the village which were empty, but one way and another they just couldn't be made available or weren't suitable or whatever, or in such a bad state of repair that we couldn't use them. Eventually, Griff Boyley suggested that above his PG store in Railway Street there were rooms which had belonged to his grandfather, Eddie Griffith, and that we could have the use of those rooms if we could get access to them. Now access to those rooms initially was through a, a stairs at the back of the shop and so to make the room uh, accessible the stairs had to be removed from where they were and reinstated at the back of the building. And that work was largely done by Michael Anderson. And he deserves tremendous credit for doing that. I can remember holding things when he hammered and worked. Now, the, the rooms which had belonged to Eddie Griffith were 
almost as if the grandfather had walked out of them the day before. The pictures were on the wall, the sideboard was there, the chairs were there. It was unbelievable. And I know that many of these eminent uh, professors and so forth that came from Queens could not believe what they were walking into. They were really quite charmed by it. We, uh, our meetings were in what had been uh, the sitting room of this house. You'll see a picture of it later on. I decided to keep the pictures and show you at the end of my talk, which will only last about another two hours. But I've mean, <laughs> only got up to 1981, Barbara. <laughs> <coughs> I don't know how long this is going to last. Anyway, we could always stop. Uh, anyway, Grendel Morton had decided that we should go or go our own. We had a number of very able people on our committee and on our membership, and it, we decided, right, we will try to research and uh, present our own talks. And we did. We, uh, we had a year's grace while Grandpa uh, Morton hadn't just pulled the plug on for seeing me the year to get going. And so we had, we had a number of people from in our organisation who researched subjects. Griffey, for example, researched Four Times Presbyterian Church, Dumpna Hamilton, local gates and gate makers. I did uh, Dr. McDermott, uh, most of the, uh, John Lennon's uh, archaeological sites in the parish of Ahadarg, and so on. And those talks made our first season of our own. And what they may have lacked in the expertise of the speakers, they certainly more than made up for in local interest. Now, in due course, when those talks uh, were all finished and we were on to the next season of talks, the, the question arose on how we would preserve these, these talks, and, or how some of them we felt deserved to be made known to a wider public. And so the suggestion was that we would uh, produce our own journal or magazine. And for many of our members that was a huge step because we started talking about £1,000 mm -hmm. and uh, as I said there was £6.23 and the guinea <laughs> wasn't really very auspicious. Anyway, I used my wee bit of experience in producing a journal that it's actually, if you go about it right and have advertising, you can actually have your magazine paid for before you get it printed. And while we didn't quite go that far, we had a large part of the, the cost of our first magazine in the kitty before we went to the printer at all. Uh, I, one of the problems with going to a printer to produce a new journal magazine is you go into a printer and say, what would it cost to produce a local history society magazine? And he said, what size is it, how many pages, and what sort of paper do you want it on, what sort of a cover do you want? And he said, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So we eventually found a, a, a journal of another group called 12 Miles of Horn, it was called, it's a book that was produced by a group around Kilkeel area, and we liked the we liked the format of it, we liked the shape of it and the, the way it was illustrated and the quality of the paper. So armed with that, I was able to go to various printers and ask them how much would 500 of those cost or whatever and so forth. And the, the, like everything else, the, the quotations vary greatly. And the cheapest quotation we got was from a, a, a printer, William McVicker and Son and Company of, of Newry. And it proved to be a bit of what's called serendipity. It was a very lucky thing for us. Not only was he the cheapest, he was the best. He actually uh, used all the old traditional methods. Going into my Vickers printers, which was just where that four, uh, five ways roundabout is today, going into it was like walking back in time. They were using uh, linotype machines and things which were really uh, back almost to Caxton. 
He had a group of, he worked in Bennett's printers in Newry, and Bennett's had a, a they had, had contracts to produce, the, they were called rulers, you know, the magazine, the, the, the copy books which children use in school with lines on them. Bennett's produced those, and Billy McVicker produced some of those as well. But he had taken the, all of Bennett's old staff with him, and some of them were old people, almost as old as me, <laughs> and uh, but they were tradesmen and great people to go into. And I over, we had produced, I think, the first six magazines for us. And I, during that time, I got to know them all very well, and they were great characters. And uh, the, the, our, we decided to go for 500 of our first magazine not knowing what the uptake would be. Well, it, it sold out very quickly and was, it sold at two pounds, two pounds a time. And uh, we, we obviously cleared our, our costs and had money in the bank for the first time ever. And that, again, the, this series of talks by local people, which provided text for articles for our magazine, that became our format. Now, in 19, no, I'd say, first of all, we, the, the society got involved in a number of projects as well. And one of them was to uh, record old houses in the community. And so we sent out people with uh, uh, cameras to take, take pictures of uh, these old houses which were crumbling, no longer occupied and crumbling away, we did that. And I have a fine resource of those in our, uh, in our room up in the credit union. Unfortunately, they're not as available to people to look at as uh, you, you'd like. You can't really, unfortunately, let people go in. But you could never have done, but you couldn't now anyway. And of course, because people, some people would, I'm not say steal, but borrow photographs out of them mm -hmm. if they're not watched. And while they might intend to bring them back, and very often they don't, because in our albums there are missing photographs. Now, uh, let me see. Uh, that was one project that we got involved with. In the early years of uh, 20, the 20th century, no, the 21st century, this is the 21st century, we got involved with an organization called JSTAR. JSTAR, we got communication from Queen's University to say that this re representative of this American JSTAR was going to be at the university and that they were going to set up a, a resource for the study of Irish history, and they wanted to include in it access to learned journals. And that really ticked all the boxes for us. We couldn't believe they we were talking about our magazine as a learned journal. Uh, the fact that it was Queen's was kind of promoting this gave us a wee bit of confidence. And so John Campbell and myself went to Queen's, and we met a young lady who was a representative of JSTOR. JSTOR, I don't know what the J-S-T-O-R stands for, but it is an offshoot of Harvard University. And they had this uh, idea to approach society such as ours, ask us for the, uh, the copyright, for want of a better word, to our magazines as we produce them, and to make them available to scholars worldwide for a fee. And at the end of the time, there would, as he said, there'd be a small income from the, for you. So I decided to go for it, and John Campbell was the man who actually followed it up with her, took her details and so forth. And we let them copy, I think, maybe the first nine magazines before we, we started. And lo and behold, then, in the springtime of the year, a check for something like £1,400 arrived, which caused us to sit back and say, 
we did well, didn't we? <laughs> so that has happened over the years. And the sale of the magazine and the income from JSTOR, which is a direct result of the magazine, has left our society on a fairly sound financial footing. In 1997, we, we had a project called A Portrait of Our Community. And we uh, set out a number of people with cameras around the doors, knocking at people's doors. Would you mind standing out to get a photograph of you and your family? And many people did, but some unfortunately did not. And looking back on that, it was quite a fascinating thing to see all those who are no longer here. Uh, we repeated it in 2007 and again in 2017. I think there might be a case for doing it every five years as opposed to every ten years, but uh, that's something to be discussed. Uh, as I say, the, the, the technology nowadays makes certain things very much easier. Uh, one of the projects that we was uh, again talked about at the very early stages was to build up a library of books of local interest. And uh, we did that and we have a, a really good library, many were quite rare books in our library, but the problem with our library is access to our library. And no, we have never been able to actually make our library available to our members in the way we envisaged. Lending them out to people is quite chancy. In fact, several very valuable books have gone completely missing because nobody knows who borrowed them. They were never left back. And uh, we have got a library of, I suppose, several hundred books, some of them quite rare. And it's one of the things for the future we should consider. I think as a reference library rather than as a lending library, uh, that we would come up with some way in which we would have a, a, a time or two in the week or the month or whatever when people could come in and uh, look at uh, our, our studies, these uh, books. I just want to look and see. I haven't mentioned a lot of names because I'm fearful of mentioning names. Because I made out a list at home of names of about 30 people who in their own way have made a great contribution to the society. Don't necessarily appear in lists of committee members or anything like that. I'm thinking of you know, in the early in the early minutes, it's quite funny, in that uh, I say Michael Hudson right in the minutes here, talking about the ladies making the tea. In those days, the ladies knew their place. Yeah. I don't I don't really mean that, but he, he refers to that uh, when we got when we got Griffiths upstairs. There was a whole lot of things we needed. We needed chairs to sit on, and there weren't any. So Michael Anderson went and got loads of those tubular stairs or chairs, and uh, I think they probably did it from pre-war. <laughs> and we, we, we got those. Griffey donated a gas cooker and a cylinder of gas, and we had to get cups and saucers and all the for the for the ladies to make the tea. That was how it was put in the minutes. So <clears throat> uh, it's very interesting that the, the minute Michael Andre, Michael Burke, Michael Hudson's uh, minutes are very precise, very good, clearly written, contain all the necessary information that you would expect in minutes, what was decided, what was not decided, and who said what and to whom. Very good. Other people's minutes are very wordy and long and uh, not as easily deciphered. And some minute takers were just plain not good. Uh, the, the value of minutes could not be overestimated when you come to do something like this. One of our minute uh, secretaries uh, filled this particular volume 
with David Baker and David Baker minutes are a treat to read. Let me read an example for you. You know, he talked about the the Miss Savage uh, models, and he talks about in the credit union up there. Therein are nine prospects and case displays of rural and farming, as it were a mere two generations ago, when life was a struggle for all but the big landowners. No greenhouse emissions, but from the exhalations of labouring horses, pulling implements, and from the, from the workers, and no easy way of doing anything but by hard physical labour. Miss Savage's record, Miss Savage's to record the past in the face of today's plenty. In those times, wives and partners, uh, during seasonal busy times, would also have to uh, be called to work in the field. Notice another one here, where we our, our treasure with a beaming smile. <laughs> Beaming smile, Elena. And another one here, he talks of the, the 17th, the 9th, uh, 09, at a, 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 a meeting present, five birds and two blokes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, typical of, da of David. Uh, anyway, Q, I think we might go to the, the pictures for me. Do I do anything or do you do something? You can, you will. That, that just be that one there for a minute to see. There we've got the finer matters. It's not the greatest picture. We've got Le, uh, Griffey, Lewis Smart, Mickey Waddle, myself, and Michael Anderson. And uh, that's, that's the, I don't even call it, it wouldn't be a triumvirate. What would it be? I don't know what it would be, but it's a, a pro consuls. Uh, we started the organisation of. All right, Q. That's a picture of one of our very, very first speakers, a lady called Molly O'Hare. She was very often uh, Sorry, do you want the light off? You turned the back lights off. No, no, no. Molly O'Hare was a major as I was the first speaker. Molly O'Hare was the second speaker. Molly O'Hare was born and bred over 80, <coughs> very knowledgeable person, and we did everything that was possible to do wrong, we did it. We brought her in, set her up at the front of a room, I guess with, with maybe twice as many people, question, questions, which you couldn't cope. Uh, it's quite a daunting thing for a person not used to it, to, to sit in front of an audience and talk to them. I in school have often invited people in to talk to the children and they couldn't cope with it. And it's, 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 it's quite a daunting experience, right Q? Now there's a picture of James Roy, <laughs> I don't know why James Roy, but very, very faithful member in the early days. But his name comes up regularly in our discussions, Basil and I, we discuss regularly when we're working on our magazine, as Alina will tell you. We will not put anything in the magazine that James Roy couldn't read. And it would just be, we were, we were aiming to make the magazine a very accessible one. Not uh, in any way playing it down the historical content, but uh, we didn't want to have to, anybody to have to have a dictionary at their elbow to see what is this all about. So the, the language in our, uh, our magazine was aimed at people like James Roy who could sit down at their fireside on a winter's night and have a good read. Okay, go ahead Q. Now there's a picture of the upper room, as we call it, in Griffiths. And you see the, the, the plaster falling off the ceiling. And uh, that's, that's not the room we met in. You went through that room to get to the room we met in, right? There's Griff and Betty. Uh, and inseparable. All you think, Betty and Griff, it sounds like a, 
1960 duo. <laughs> uh, I think it was a Mickey and Griff, wasn't there? Yeah. Way back then, singers. Anyway, next to you, there we are in, the, in that room, and you see that the pictures remain in the room, the shades remain to the lamp, and the, if you could see, there's, there's furniture there now. Unfortunately, I'm in the very front of that. It wasn't intended by me to be that way. But the ladies sitting in that front row are uh, Betty Wiley, Anne Campbell, Mrs. Smith, Alice O'Hare, and on the extreme right, the Reverend Noel. Right behind him is Andrew Holiday. I can't tell who is the person. Terry, Terry Murray. Terry Murray is a, 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 a grey haired lady leaning forward there, and I can't say who she is. Right behind my head is John Lennon, just the top of his head. Then there's Billy Hearn, indispensable Billy, did so much for the society. And Harry O'Hare, Harry O'Hare was the chairman of the society, very enthusiastic member of our society during that period of time that they kept up the historical society going. Several lectures by him to our members over the years. Next then is Seamus Savage and on the back wall there's John Joe Sands. He looks to be a dark glass stone. And then beside him is Mick Wallen. On the left there who are those? Come on, oh, that's our Neil Rockland right Charlie. in the corner. Charlie Donald And Charlie Donald is right. Yes, Charlie Donald. And if there's someone there behind Charlie, who is that? I don't know. I, something I wanted to say. When we were, when we decided to, to, to produce a magazine, it was a huge debate. And a, and a, a, a gathering simply, I thought, what are we going to call this magazine? And there were all kinds of fanciful names we come up with. We wanted something that was, again, let's come back to James Roy, something that was not off-putting. Things like reflections or the far past or whatever we didn't, we... And it was our needle up and the lady at the very back underneath the round thing on the wall who suggested, before I forget, I think she actually suggested, oh, and before I forget, which might have been better still. We wanted just an everyday phrase that people could identify with, and that's where the name came from. <coughs> At some stage, we must have had a debate about, her, about it, and uh, I must have related to a committee meeting that, and I'll have to tell you that the name was suggested by our Nero Lockton. Uh, David Baker was taking the minutes, and obviously he didn't hear it quite clearly because in the minutes it says that the name, before I forget, was suggested by Neil O'Rathlin. <laughs> anyway, next to you, please. That is a, a cousin of Griffey Wiley's outside Griffey shop. To, to get access to the upstairs there, you had to go up the entry with the, the big door, big gate behind that man's back, okay? And there are the ladies who made the tea. Uh -huh. Annie McSherry and Maura Canavan uh, who made the tea, a delicious tea. So we thank them very much in their absence. A very indispensable part of it because the cup of tea after our meetings, which I'm sadly missing tonight, uh, was often a time for a great bit of chat between our, um, our members. We miss that for the time being, but whoever. Next to you, please. There's another group, and that's not in. Uh, uh, where is that taken? It's an writing. Yes, it is indeed. It probably says on my list. Sorry. Uh, it doesn't actually say where it is, uh, but it's in the is there again? Jim was a very keen photographer, made a tremendous contribution, served on the committee, 
very willing, always very willing person, and uh, <coughs> uh, you couldn't, couldn't praise him enough. Go ahead, Q. Uh, Mickey Waddle posing because that contra moment uh, at the fire somewhere or other, and Mickey generally liked to pose. Go ahead. And this is Mickey. We went on an outing to Strokestown and we came back and we stopped in a, a restaurant somewhere along the way. But someone had informed the restaurant that it was Mickey's 80th birthday. And that is uh, what's not taking place there. Who are they? Is it Gimpy? And who's the other person? I don't know. Anyway. <coughs> and I could go again. That's again the same Mickey's, par Mickey's party in Strokestown or wherever it was. Go again. There we have Lewis Smart, Kathleen Smart, and Margaret. Uh, Marks. Margaret Marks. And uh, we. We may meet a lot of gentlemen in our time, but we never meet anybody nicer than Lewis, nor a nicer lady than uh, Kathleen. But, uh, indeed, Margaret's a very nice person. <laughs> <laughs> said, said he. <laughs> and uh, that's Lewis again, right? There we have Lewis and Jim Sturt, and uh, where is that now? That's at Hearn's Museum out there in Mourns, you know? Remember we went there? That uh, is in a big shed on the farm. It's a fabulous museum, well worth a visit. Next we come to... Jordy Anderson, is that in the back? That's Jordy at the back, indeed it is. Indeed it is. Now there is the subject of tonight's talk. Uh, many on the left and Sarah on the right. And a few other worthies in the background. Uh, I'll tell you that picture there, go back, thank you. I just see a cleric in the background. That picture was taken at Drummond Time. I think, okay, on the go. There they are again, the pair of them. Minnie was born in 1901, and Sarah was born a few years earlier. They were telling me about, remember, watching. Uh, Haley's Comet in 1912. Guess you go ahead. Is that their house? Yes. That is their house, yes. That is indeed. That now is Deborah's house. Sorry? Now Deborah's house. Deborah's house. That's now. your that's your house now, Deborah, yes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, go ahead, Q. As Tim Ferris, Tim came to live in Kilcoda House and immediately became involved in the, in the community and proved to be one of our staunchest members. When we uh, campaigned to save the railway cabin in Railway Street, Tim led deputation to see the chiefs of Northern Ireland Railways, and we won our case, and they, they, they kept it still there, of course. Unfortunately, Tim died, but he was a, he was a, a stalwart of this organisation. Go ahead, please. Tim presenting Terry Murray with a honorary membership. Terry, again, was basically well, certainly before that, on a long ago, Terry died, but for the first 40 years of the society, he was never missed. He never missed an outing. Go ahead, Q. Oh, no. <laughs> <what it's> <laughs> Tommy Mora. Tommy Mora and Terry Murray. A lovely picture. Tommy, larger than life character, oh. great one. These sort of people will not see their legs again. Go ahead, you. There's Ross, Ross Chapman uh, mm -hmm. speaking to the Lord Mayor of Sean Hawley. It was Lord Mayor of Armagh at the time, and Tim there. I should say that 
our society was very lucky in that certain people attached themselves to our society who weren't, strictly speaking, from this area. We had Dr. Pamela Marshall from Mark Hill, Market Hill, who became a, a tremendous member of our society, and then over a long, long period of years, uh, one of our great stalwarts, and Ross Chapman from Murray, he just loved the ambience of our society. He, he, he hated the formality of the old Newry society, but he loved the informality and the crack and the company of the society, and he added tremendously to it himself. Go ahead, Kim. That is uh, Helen Delahunty. She was like a bit of like Haley's Comet, really. <laughs> Herself and myself, she was served and still serves. I wish she lived in Dallas now, but because of the marvels of modern communication, we can still include her in our magazine discussions at times. And herself and myself often had come to love her heads over a while that there should or should not be a comma somewhere else. <laughs> <coughs> again, and Sharon Hawhey. Oh, well, that's me talking to Ross in the background. Is that Helena? Yeah. And I don't the know first that's... culture night, I must say. Huh? Those are all the first culture night. Oh, culture night, yes. Mm. Yes. Go ahead. This is a, 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 a committee meeting, but it's not, a, it's not strictly speaking a local history meeting. Around 1900, and, I keep 1900. 2001 or two, a group of us decided to see about producing a visitor's guide to the village and a visitor's guide to the uh, area. And this is the committee that uh, oversaw that. And uh, I have to say, very successfully. Uh, uh, I, I couldn't and shouldn't and daren't uh, talk about our society and not mention Barbara as being absolutely pinnacle of uh, perfection as far as our society is concerned. Put in a tremendous amount of work. Uh, I mean, the chairs you're sitting on today, Barbara, and I said, put them out. Uh, <laughs> she did that all the time. <laughs> she did that. You know, it, it reminds me of a, in an old western about the man who produced a paper called the Shinbone Star. <laughs> he was the, not only the, the owner, the proprietor, the editor, the reporter, as he said, he also swept the joint out. <laughs> so about Barbara, that's about the only thing you don't do, Barbara. And maybe you do, that, I don't know. But there we have Dr. Marshall on the left, nearly her, Mary was again, a short, relatively short time, herself and David Baker came together and uh, were great assets to the place, no doubt about it. Margaret McElroy, sharpers for several years, and uh, just the circumstances of her family life meant that she had to drop out of the society, but while she was there, she contributed greatly. Bernadette Daly, Again, a good, a great supporter, and uh, Billy, Billy Hearn is in there just behind you, Barbara. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, uh, well, I'll we'll take a whole talk to talk about Billy and her contribution. Full of ideas, most of them totally impractical. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but oh, greatly loved by us all. This is the. Uh, the, the group who produced this uh, visitor's guide. See there, Joe Devlin at the back, myself, Francis Savage, and Terry Murray, and then along the front, Mary Hur, David Baker, uh, Barbara, and Margaret McElroy. A very good little committee with me, and a very good time together. Okay, David Baker, as I said, I read some of his minutes there. David never. Uh, he never went for a small word for a big one would do, <laughs> or two big ones. 
we talked about such a thing as a gargantuan task. Okay? He, he loved those kind of work. It was a, a one-off, there's no doubt about it. And I was telling him about the walk I did, a relatively small walk, and uh, I said to David, did you ever do any walking yourself? Oh, I did, I did. Did a bit of walking. I said, where did you walk to? Well, I walked to uh, the base camp in Everest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I said, well, I don't walk myself at all. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that it been, been a radio operator on a merchant ship during the war, around the world numerous times, kind of things like a lamb from New Zealand. Been in convoys across the Atlantic, seen uh, merchant ships sunk by German torpedoes and so forth, and had, but so self effacing, so uh, modest, unbelievably so. Great character, he's still with us, but unfortunately not present in, uh, in person anymore. Okay, Mary, her, said Mary was terrific while she was at herself. On we go. And oh, here's oh, an icon of our <laughs> organization. Every year for at least one at least twenty-five years, at the annual general meeting, when the when the committee stood down, the election of a new committee took place, it was overseen by the Reverend uh, South Cecil Scott. And uh, he had an inimitable way of doing it, and he thanked everybody for the, the, the all waited for that thanks that he, uh, he bestowed upon us. Uh, a great character, and so sadly missed. Uh, awful modest man, really genuine man, a sincere, one of the few Christians I've ever met. Okay? And another individual, Jimmy Cluelo from the Sun. Uh, again, uh, as Ross Chapman and Mr. Bridger, Jimmy Kerman Kudo said, he started off talking about wills in the talk he gave to the society and ended it by singing by the bright silvery light of the moon. <laughs> How it came to that, Ross couldn't work out. <laughs> On the go, this is a magazine committee, launched a magazine, don't know which number that is. 1990, probably about number five or six or seven, something like that. And there's John, Mickey Waddle, myself, Andrew Holiday, and others, starboard of our organisation, Griffey, Charlie Donnelly, who was chairman that year, uh, Pippi, and yeah. Yeah. who's the one that left? Yeah. Griff. Yeah. Griff. On we go. Another, I think yeah. yeah. the same. Group and that is Ross and Robina Chapman. Ross and his wife Robina are uh, again, we're always delighted to see Robina. Right, on we go. This is a group outing and um, uh, I'm not sure exactly where that is. I've lost track of my. The boy, uh, uh, to the Boyne Valley, and you probably can pick out a few clients in that picture. Uh, I have a rather small group, I can see Billy Aaron there, and I can see Sheila Murphy. Uh, anyway, see Mary Her. Anyway, on the go, another picture of the same. Teddy will want to be a bit closer to him. That picture there is taken at Peatland, as you can see the, the uh, uh, engine is there. Next one, there's the parking fee for the Giant Causeway. Thirty, nineteen eighty nine, five pounds. Points past historical. <laughs> that is all wrong. Anyway, uh, the next one is a Craigan. Uh, 
last time, the Tazama, an old, old graveyard there. Next one, <laughs> Dabney Dab <laughs> Island. It's just a random selection. Next one, that one is taken on uh, an outing to Stormont. Again, you look closely at it. Right, go ahead. In 1998, in in which was the, the bicentenary of the 1798 rebellion, Ross Chapman uh, directed or produced a little playlet which uh, reenacted the signing or the swearing in of a member of the United Irishmen. And they've got Austin Smith. Who's that? Is that you, Barbara? I'm afraid so. <laughs> God, Barbara, you're looking well. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, who's that? Is that Ross? Ross? And, uh, you know, there's a certain oath that the United Irishmen took on the go. That's another, that's the same, same group. Right, in 1994, the society did something quite unusual in that in 1894, there had been a concert in the, in what is uh, now Paddy Sessions, but it's then at the courthouse. And uh, in 1994, our society attempted to restage the same concert with the same, uh, not the same people, of course, but the same, <laughs> the same program. And uh, they all dressed up in what we took a period dress. Okay, on we go. There we are. And there is Andrew Holliday, Barbara, John Campbell, myself, Dr. Marshall, and Michael Anderson, as, as we used to be. <laughs> and he's a, a local icon, again, of the village, uh, a slightly eccentric lady, Mary McGill, sadly gone, part of the cult, part of the corner locally. Go ahead, King. There's another one of Mary Moore, Moore in our Sunday best. Mm -hmm. On the go. Now this is a, in this video of all world, very proud. And uh, Dean William Morton, who's a dean of Christchurch Church Cathedral in Dublin, uh, following in the footsteps of Jonathan Swift. Uh, and that's his aunt, Aggie Whiteside. And I'm not sure exactly what relationship, if any, there is to Alfie Donald, but Alfie would be in the same uh, neck of the woods. Uh, Dean William came and spoke to us, and he also uh, hosted a meeting for us when we went to, to visit St. Colm's Cathedral in Derry. On the go to, that's just a group of locals. Uh, we have a, in our, rooms up there we have a tremendous collection nowadays of photographs. That's Tommy McVeigh, uh, Tommy McSherry, Jim Lennon, Terry Murray, McGribbon, Tom Burns and Pat Campbell. Is any of them living? No, they're all gone unfortunately, a lot of them. Right? Uh, this is a picture of George Pass. Uh, George Porter and uh, let's see who it is. It's not. It's not his wife. Mm. George Porter and his sister Mabel at George Pass Post Office. Don't know who the wee girl is or the person at the door. Huh? Probably Jillian. Right. Could well be. Go ahead. That is Mrs. Oh, Clark God. in her shop in, uh, well, I don't know what to call it, William Street, real estate. She, they always refer to it as Bridge Street. And uh, you don't, they don't make them like that anymore. No. I should say in passing, Tom Clark was for many years a very active 
enthusiastic member of our group. And, uh, uh, you know, I've omitted the names of so many, many excellent people, people like Jim Hamilton, who have been our librarian for years, and uh, people like uh, Jim and Joan Dalzell, John Campbell and Brian and Bert Ridge, who spent ages and ages transcribing headstones in various local graveyards, and uh, which have added tremendously to our, the interest in our magazine. People basically spent ages just browsing through the the, 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 the names on the on the headstones. It's 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 a fascinating thing. As a young lady, a, do, a, nie, a granddaughter of Pat Turley's, we had, we had a St. Patrick's Day concert, and that was, she played Ellen Pipes, right? Next. Now, this is quite a unique sort of a thing. <laughs> I, in a moment of madness, wrote a play called The Monster of Acton Lake, and in the plot of the play was about a, a druid who was thrown into the lake by St. Patrick. And when, it, when they wanted somebody to play the part of St. Patrick, you know, would imagine the cheek of me approaching uh, Canon Michael Barton to see would he play the part. He was such a good sport, he did, and he thoroughly enjoyed it. Such a lovely man he was. He is, I presume, he's still, still to the fore. So there we've got Tim Ferriss, who was a narrator, Canon Michael Barton, who was St. Patrick, John Waddell, who was Big Pot, Helena Campbell, who was, I can't remember, Deirdre was, and Joanna Hamill, who was Wee Pot. <laughs> anyway, I want to go to There we've got Brian Birdridge, who was secretary for a long time, along with local Icon, I suppose you call him Fergie Murphy. Bird Ridge and her husband Brian were indispensable for a long, long time with us. And I was just saying to Barbara today when we were out to church, we would miss Brian and Barbara would sure to be here. See that everything was in order. They've gone back to England, much, much missed. Again, to. Right, that's again the barrel, and this is a photographic exhibition that we've gone for uh, Heritage Day. Some of our photographs just mounted on boards for people to see. Next, please. And there's Brian and Burl. They were presented by the Wednesday Club with a, a, a composite picture of the village and areas around the village. That was earlier this year, before they left. And finally, go ahead, and finally there's a picture taken by Jim Sturt of a lady called Pearly Hannah, who lived in a house just up the, up the Market Hill Road. And uh, I think it almost uh, uh, epitomizes an, an age that is gone. And uh, that house, nothing really had changed in it. The fan bellows, the, the open fire, the crook and the crane were there as well. So I say, that's part of the 1997 picture of the community. Of course, you need to go back because apparently, unfortunately, he's no longer with us. So I, I, I ended up to say, I don't know where or how you would rate our performance over 50 years, whether we. Uh, have achieved anything or much or left any legacy behind us at all, how far we have achieved our aims. Uh, <clears throat> is it, our people say you have a tremendously strong society. Now, a society, I suppose, uh, you're trying to tell me something, Q. Nice. Uh, the, the, um, Society still depends on a relatively small number of people. And uh, in order for our society to <clears throat> flourish, 
it depends on people making a commitment. And it would be easy to go back to the, the time of, I don't know, as Queen's Extramural Department still uh, provide that service or not. But what had happened to our society during those years when Queen's were in, 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 providing this wonderful service for us, we had gone from being a local history society to being an historical society. <coughs> and uh, our main source of income is our magazine. Our magazine can only be produced if, there's, if there is material to fill it. And the material has got to be generated by our own members and it has to be on topics which are local. Uh, and so I, anybody here present or out there in the crowd wherever you are, uh, <laughs> If you have a subject you'd like to research, researching today is infinitely easier than it was uh, 50 years ago. You can do all your research from your own living room. You've got the census online, you've got Irish genealogy online, we've got the British newspaper archives, hundreds of newspapers that can be accessed, various other things as well. So if you've got a topic that you're interested in, basically, if it has a local connection, then why not consider giving a talk to a society? And in due course, it may well make it into our magazine. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's all, folks, as I say at the end of Looney Tunes. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you very much. Might I just say an apology, I'm sure that I've missed out people who were absolutely vital to the success of the society. Please forgive me. I value you all. Thank you.